Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you are fine wherever you are. I am the Akatuta, Mr. Mutimkulu Jerry. This is our second day in our revision phase for Aka Financial Management, uh, June 2024 revision visual. Okay, uh, I call it a visual because uh, uh, it is time for prayers, time for you know, for us to cross over the River Jordan to another side. Okay, so uh, I hope uh, by the end of this video, you are going to understand how to tackle uh, a section B question uh, in the ACA financial management paper. Okay, so without much ado, let us go straight to the questions. Now, this is our first question. It has been taken from uh, the specimen 2016 ACA financial management paper. And uh, uh, I hope, you know, it is going to assist you in some way in preparing for your upcoming ACA financial management exam. Okay. PACO currently has the following long-term capital structure. Okay, equity finance. Uh, we have got owner shares 30 million, reserves 38.4 million, and they give us a total of 68.4 million. Then we've got non current liabilities, uh, which include bank loans 15 million, 8% convertible loan notes 40 million. 5% redeemable preference shares, 15 million. And they give us a total of 70 million. And if we add the equity finance and the non current liabilities, if we add them, we get this particular total. Now, additional information. The 8% loan notes are convertible into eight ordinary shares per loan note in seven years time. If not converted, the loan notes can be redeemed on the same future date at the nominal value of $100. PACO has a cost of debt of 9% per year. The owner shares of PACO have a nominal value of dollar per share. The current X dividend share price of the company is $10.9 per share. And share price is expected to grow by 6% per year for the foreseeable future. The equity beta of PACO is 1.2. Okay, now this is the information we have been given. Remember, a section B question uh is going to be a scenario okay you're going to have to have in section b you're going to have three scenario questions which have got five sub questions actually you're going to have three scenarios okay with five questions so they give a total of 15 questions three scenarios which have got five questions in each and they give a total of 15 questions which are worth two marks so section b we expect you to score 30 marks okay and in section a again we expect you to score 30 marks so this actually means that in section C, we are going to be required to score 40 marks. So there are two questions in section C, which are a little bit long, okay? But they are not going to be objective test questions, but scenario, I mean, um, it's a best actually, you need to write something, to input something, type a few sentences and so forth. Okay. So this is uh, what we have on the table. So now let us go straight to the first question.
I mean, related to this scenario. Number one, the loan note has secured on non current assets of PACO and the bank loan is secured by a floating charge on the current assets of the company. All right. So, uh, which of the following shows the sources of finance of PACO in order of the risk to the investor with the risk, the riskiest first? So, which of these sources of finance are going to be the riskiest? All right. So, you need to rank them according to their risk with the riskiest source first. That's the question. Okay. So now, uh, if you go back, you are told that uh, the uh, the loan notes, these ones, the eight percent, are secured with a non-current asset, and the bank loan is secured with a with some current assets. Okay. Uh, so you then have to have some little bit of. Uh, the pecking order theory. Remember, all these are sources of finance, the equity and the, uh, I mean, the borrowings, the liabilities. Okay, so both are the sources of finance. However, you need to use the pecking order theory to understand uh, how these are, you know, are ranked. All right? Usually companies, when they are, uh, want to finance themselves they start with the retained earnings from retained earnings they go to uh loans the loan notes which are secured from they they go to uh say uh the bank the bank loan from the bank loan they move on to uh, the preference shares then lastly they go to the share equity shares all right so you can see that uh, the most risk, risky of the investments is actually the equity shares from the investors point of view equity shares are the most uh risky investment why because uh they are going to be considered last when the company is up uh, is going to be liquidated they are going to be given uh i mean to be compensated last after the creditors have been uh settled are we together good so uh after equity shares, uh, I mean, uh, before equity shares, their preference shareholders, they are also going to be given something. Then, but before them, we need to ensure that the bank uh, has been given, uh, I mean, the loan has been repaid to the bank. And before that, those loan holders, uh, the loan notes holders uh, have to be settled. All right now the reason why we put retained earnings retained earnings are funds of the common however they are considered the the most comfortable source of finance because there are no hassles the directors have all the liberty to utilize them the way they want all right there is no third party that is going to poke into their space and says hey what are you going what are you doing with those monies all right so with that short background i think we then have to make an a choice all right so you can see that uh according to my explanation i say that the equity um, equity finance is the most risky source of finance so you can see that by that background our choices should be between b and d because uh those are the uh i mean the choices with the ordinary shares being the most uh risky 
uh, source of finance. However, if we are looking at B, it then says that uh, after the ordinary shares, we need to consider loan notes, then we consider the uh, preference shares, and then lastly, the bank loan. Now, we have been told, actually, we have been told that uh, the bank loan is uh, secured by a floating charge. A floating charge or a variable charge is something that, you know, is not fixed, which means sometimes it might be too unbearable depending on the conditions of the market or depending on the conditions uh, or prevailing in the economy. So it's not a safe option. It's more risky. Right. So in that case, uh, we can see that uh, these have to be considered before the ordinary, uh, I, I mean, uh, before the loan not. They are more risky before, uh, uh, more, risi more risky than the uh, loan not. Okay, so if we are looking at B, we can see that the loan notes have been put first before the bank loan. So by that fact, we can see that B is wrong. Okay, this one is wrong. So therefore, we are left with D. You can see that D is correct if you analyze, yes, ordinary shares are riskier, followed by the preference shares, which are riskier as well. Then the bank loan, because the bank loan is uh, secured by a floating charge, it is more riskier than uh, the loan note, the loan notes which are secured with a non current asset whose value is stable. Are we together? So the answer is D. Okay. Now let's look at number two. What is the conversion value of the 8% loan notes of Paco after seven years? All right. Here we need then to understand something. Students need to understand what the question is requiring them to, to do. Okay. Here we are being asked to determine the conversion value. Now, for these shareholders to convert uh, or to go for the option for conversion, they need to, to determine if it is lucrative first. Okay. They need to see an advantage in that option. Okay. So, how do they see that? They then uh compare the redemption value which in this case is hundred dollars versus the conversion value now the conversion value is based on the uh share price the share price multiplied by the number of shares per loan note. This was uh, nominal value per, nomi per, per, uh, per loan note, I remember. So we compare like and like. So let us determine the share price in seven years. The share price in seven years, we are told that the current share price today is ten dollars ninety okay and we are going to have eight ordinary shares per loan note so ten dollars ninety multiplied by eight shares in seven years all right multiply by uh multiply by the increase remember we are told that uh the share price 
the share prices are expected to increase by 6% per year. So uh, we say multiply by 1.067 to the power n. n is the number of years, in this case to the power 7. So let's punch this information in our calculators. So where's my calculator? All right, I found it. So we are saying 10.9 multiply by 8 multiply by 1.06. Oh, doesn't have powers. Okay. To the power 7. So that's 131.7. So, what is our answer? Obviously, a clever student has, has uh, uh, seen that the answer there should be C. This is our answer, ladies and gentlemen, the conversion value. So, you can see that obviously the shareholders are going to vie for the uh, conversion option because it gives them more money. Now, question three is saying, assuming the conversion value after seven years is 1.26.15, I mean 126.15, what is the current market value of the 8% loan notes of uh, Parco? Now, the market value, the current market value, market value is the present value of future cash flows discounted at work or sometimes <laughs> discounted at the cost of capital right so in this case we we, we are going to say 126.15 multiplied by the discount rate what was the discount rate what was our cost of capital from uh, the question So we can clearly see that the cost of capital was um, 9%. Sorry. Don't know what's happening with my pen. 9% that, that is the cost of uh, debt. Okay. So we are going to discount here with the cost of debt. Okay. All right. Remember I said like and like. In this case, we are determining the market value of debt. So we then have to determine that using the cost of debt. So remember, uh, debt is made up of the repayment of the principal as well as the interest. So the 126 here, all right is the principal component all right so this is the principal component is repaid in year seven so we need to discount it uh with the uh discount factor for year seven so that's the pv uh year seven i mean uh the present value factor year seven all right at uh we determined that the cost of capital was nine percent right nine percent year seven all right so let me just say seven years so this will come to uh, the principal would be with how much today so if we go to the present value factor present value tables i think let me look for those yes i think these are the uh tables that's these are not the iut tables no we go to the uh present value why because uh this is an an, an uh, i mean a cash flow that is going to okay in one year that is in year seven only 
So we we use the present value table. Annuity tables are used on a recurring cash flows on an annual basis. Cash flows which are going to occur on annually. For example, interest. So when you when we want the present value for interest payments, we are going to use the annuity table. Why? Because the interest is an annual event. It is a recurring. So uh, in this case. We are talking of seven years, so we need to go to where they intersect, and we will see that the discount factor is 0 0.547. So we take that into our computation 0 0.547. So this gives us uh, the payment of how much? I mean the the present value of um, one twenty six point one five multiplied by zero point five four seven, so that it comes to sixty nine point zero zero. Okay, now that one is only the principal. What about the interest? So we need also to consider the interest, okay? Remember, the interest is based on the nominal value of the bond, nominal value of the loan note, and the nominal value was $100, okay? So that's, we are told that this, these loan notes attract 8% interest. So 8% multiplied by 100, it comes to $80. So the interest every year is $80 multiply by the discount factor, uh, uh, which is the annuity factor, 9%, uh, 7 years. This time we are using the annuity factors. So this comes to 8 multiply by, if we go to the annuity tables, sorry, uh, the annuity tables, we do the same thing, seven years, nine percent. So you will see that the annuity tables are going to tell us of 5.033. So this is the amount 5.033. So let us compute that. 8 multiplied by 5.033 it comes to 40.264 so let then let us then get the total of these two figures uh 69 plus 40. Uh, we will get a hundred and nine point two six to two decimal places. So you can see that it's very easy to get these uh, figures. You just need to know what is going on because if you do not know what is going on, you are highly likely uh, going to fail. Let's move on. Now, question number four, which of the following statements relating to capital asset pricing model is correct? Okay, the CAPAM, the CAPAM, ladies and gentlemen. The CAPAM, that formula that says uh, RE is equal to RF plus theta RA minus RF. Okay, uh, RF is the risk-free rate, uh, which is equivalent, equivalent to treasure bills and so forth. Uh, I mean, the cost of treasure bills and so forth, which are considered less risk investments. Then beta is the uh, measure of you know, of uh, the uh, systematic risk, all right? 
measure of the systematic risk. What is systematic risk? It is that risk which cannot be diversified away. All right? So the assumption is that that's the only risk we need to think about because other risks have been taken care of by the investors, all right, through their portfolio diversification strategies, all right? The assumption is that investors are rational people. They know what they are doing when they make investment. So the CAPA is a formula that takes into account only the systematic risk, the risk of the uh, within the market, the general economy, which cannot be reduced by any form of diversification. That's the risks that matter. Okay, then RRM is the market uh, risk. Uh, the actually the average market risk. Okay, and then uh, the RRF is still the uh, risk free rate. Now. Uh, the RM minus RF is sometimes called the market risk premium, okay, or market premium or market risk premium. So sometimes the examiner simply tells you that the market risk premium was so much, and do not make a mistake of replacing the RM with the market risk premium. They are different things, okay. Uh, the RM is sometimes called the return on the market or something like that. Okay, so uh, that's the idea there. So what you need to know is uh, uh, you need to tell yourself the meaning of the beta. What is the meaning of beta less than one? What is the meaning of beta uh, zero? When beta is zero or when beta is uh greater than one you need to understand those uh those uh, uh situations okay okay uh, i'm looking for a pen i need a pen here to illustrate something Okay, uh, a beta which is less than one shows that uh, the security is less is less risky. Okay, whereas a beta greater than one. is on average riskier so this one is on average less risky whereas the the one with the beta greater than one is more risky what about the one with a beta of zero so if you put if you put a zero on this formula it means that the cost of capital re will be equal to the risk free rate okay as all these will become zero so is uh an investment that is uh that actually is not being affected by the systematic risk there is no systematic risk in that particular environment as i have indicated a risk free rate is considered government risk or risk associated with treasury bills. So if you invest in treasury bills, your investment is considered to be uh, riskless. All right, why? Because uh, governments are well known to be able to repay debts. So if you loan the government, you are assured that you are going to get your principal investment as well as any interest attached. I guess that is so in many countries, okay, or over the world. So, given that background, given that background, ladies and gentlemen, excuse me, given that background, what is the solution to question number four? 
let us attack the question step by step. Let's look at uh, part A or choice A. The equity beta of Parco considers only business risk. Is that true? Okay. Uh, if we look at the question, we are told that the equity beta of Paco is 1.2. Okay. That point alone tells us that this is a riskier investment. However, okay, why? Because it, its beta is more than one. Okay, so it's actually riskier. However, that does not tell us much about the business risk, blah, blah. So we then have to go deeper into our Kappa theory of a risk investment. The Kappam theory uh, speaks of uh, systematic risk. Now, systematic risk has got two components. There is the business risk as well as financial risk. This is represented by what we call the beta equity. Okay. If uh, in the case of our power call, this particular company, you can see that this company has both business risk and financial risk. Financial risk is risk that is introduced in the company or in the business from debt finance. So the moment you take debt, you have assumed financial risk. Are we together? Okay, so the moment these guys took loans, whether bank loan, convertible loan, or the redeemable preference shares, they have assumed financial risk. Financial risk is the risk of default, the risk of failing to repay the creditors, the risk of facing adverse interest rates. All those impact on the financial risk of the business. So such type of risk is part of the beta equity or the equity beta. If the company was wholly financed by equity, we were only going to see what is called a beta asset. That shows that the company is wholly financed by equity. So in this case, we can see, we can safely see, or we can safely say that A is wrong. The equity beta of Paco is not only showing business risk, but is also showing financial risk. Am I talking to somebody? Am I talking to somebody? Good. Let's look at B. The capital asset pricing model considers systematic risk and unsystematic risk. I have already indicated that the capital asset pricing model only considers systematic risk. Okay? Not unsystematic risk. Unsystematic risk is a risk that is only uh, unique, or, or, or let me just say, only salient, only uh, linked to the business itself, okay, or the project itself. All right, for example, if we are having a problem of uh, I mean, uh, 
employees who are not qualified enough to do their job. That is a risk that is only common to a particular company, not to all the companies in the country. So it's a risk that is attached to a particular company or to a particular uh, investment project. So uh, as it does not affect the whole economy or the market, then it is considered unsystematic risk. And that's a risk which can be dealt with by the investors through their diversification. They can get rid of a portfolio that is not performing because it is its risks are only common to that particular portfolio and not the entire market. So that one can be diversified away. However, the CAPA only considers the systematic risk. Please watch out. So B is wrong because it is saying that it considers both the systematic and unsystematic risk, which is wrong. Now let's look at C. The equity beta of power core indicates that the carbon is more risky than the market as a whole. This is correct because I have already indicated that when the beta is greater than one, then on average the carbon is a risky investment. All right, it is a risk investment uh, in comparison to the market as a whole. Okay, what about D? The debt beta of power core is zero. Okay, why is this point wrong? Okay, here we are being taken to our understanding of the uh, gearing and re uh, and the gearing and re gearing formula. I'm sure you are aware of that. Okay, uh, let us. Uh, go to that formula. Let me look for that formula so that um, we will cover that aspect once and for all. Okay, I found the formula. All right, so if you look at uh, the asset beta formula, you can see that uh, if the BD the beta the debt beta okay if the debt beta is zero it means that we are only going to have this part of the formula okay if the uh debt of the uh, i mean if the bit of the debt is zero then we are only going to be left with beta asset and I've already indicated that beta asset is for the ungeared firm, an ungeared company. Now, is this the case with Paco? Paco has got both equity and debt finance. So therefore, the debt beta can be zero. <laughs> so it's very simple to reason out this uh, because if the the the, uh, the debt beta of Paco is zero, it means that it is an all equity finance firm, which is not the case. Are we together, ladies and gentlemen? So you can actually see that to pass this particular question, it's I mean it was very 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 easy. Okay. Now, uh, let's do part five. Which of the following statements are problems in using the price earnings ratio method to value a company? Okay, you need to understand the price earnings ratio. However, the theory is very simple and I left it up to you to research about it. But one thing I know is that for you to determine uh a suitable ratio for the purpose of valuation of a carbon is not 
an easy road. You will face a lot of hassle. Okay, it's very difficult to get that ratio. Okay, two, it is only applicable in valuing shares of listed companies. So you can see that actually our answer is B. Are we together, ladies and gentlemen? So B turns out to be the best answer there. So you need to have some uh, background of these things for you to be able to ask the questions. Now let us do one more question before we call the section B questions a done deal. Okay, okay, Rockstars, uh, we have uh, traveled a long journey by now and we must congratulate ourselves for uh, achieving uh, this far. So uh, in this particular question, we are going to deal with uh, interest rate risk as well as uh, a little bit of current risk management. Okay, so um, the question is ZPS Core. ZP, ZPS Core, whose home currency is the dollar, took out a fixed interest peso bank loan several years ago when peso interest rates were relatively cheap compared to dollar interest rates. ZPS Core does not have any, any income in pesos. Economic difficulties, excuse me, have now increased peso interest rates while dollar interest rates have remained relatively stable. ZPS Core must pay interest on the dates set by the bank. A payment of 5 million pesos is due in six months time. The following information is available. So you are given uh, information concerning uh, the first table here is about uh, the uh, forex rates. Okay. So we have got the spot rate, I mean the spot rates and the forward rates, the six months forward rates. So uh, you then have to be able to articulate which would be which, okay? Then uh, interest rates, which can be used by ZPS Core. So these are the interest rates. Now, the first question, what is the dollar cost of a forward market hedge? So for you to answer this question, you then have to, to I mean, to refer to the forward, uh, uh, I mean, forward rates. So uh, what is the exposure here? The exposure is the payment. And the payment is going to take place in six months. So remember, if we, I mean, in any situation, whether we are going to pay or we are going to receive a payment, the bank is always going to be on the advantage or on the better side. So if this is a payment, the payment is 5 million, sorry, these are pesos, so 5 million pesos. This means that uh, we need to have a rate that is going to make sure that we pay more. So from the two rates, this rate 
and that which uh, rate, which of the two rates do you think is going to lead us to pay more? Obviously, for us to convert uh, the payment, I mean the pesos into USD, okay, for us to convert the pesos into USD, we need a rate that is lower. Because a lower rate is going to ensure that we pay more. So we use the 12.805 and not the 12.889. Because if we use the 12.889, we are going to pay low or less. So uh, let me use a calculator. Uh, where is the calculator? So if we use the 12.889, it means we'll be paying less. So the banks won't allow that. We need to pay more. So we say 5 million divided by 12.805 and we will have to pay uh, 390 472.47 which is equal to 390 472 to the nearest whole number so that's A the answer is A there Okay, going ahead. Which of the following is or are correct for both purchasing power parity theory and interest rate parity theory? Okay, so you are being tested on your understanding of the page of the two uh, theories. Okay, so. Uh, Let's look at item one. The theory holds in the long term uh, rather than the short term. Yes, when we look at the uh, purchasing power parity and the interest rate uh, parity theories, we would uh, be expecting to see results in the longer term and not the short term. So A, I mean, one is correct. What about two? The exchange rate reflects the different cost of living in two countries. Now, one thing you have to understand about this question is that uh, these statements, one, two, three, should be congruent, should be supporting the views of the two theories so we have determined that item one is actually consistent with both theories however item two which talks of the exchange rate it means that it is only affecting the purchasing power parity and not the interest rate parity theory because the interest rate part theory does not talk of the exchange rate are we together it talks of the interest rate so in that regard statement number two is wrong so everything that is got a two should be wrong on your choices so you are left with the c and d so let's read item three the currency the currency of the country with the higher inflation rate will weaken against the other currency does this apply to both the uh, purchasing power parity and the interest rate uh, parity theory. Obviously, it's, it is affecting the purchasing power parity. So, in that regard, it is false. So, the only answer there was D. One only. Okay, let's attack 
uh, question eight, what are the appropriate six month interest rates for ZPS Co to use if the company hedges the peso payment using the money market hedge? Now, like I said, you need to first establish what type of exposure is this one. This is a payment. So for the payment, uh, the trick I use is that you need to first deposit okay, the amount, deposit the amount, or let me just say deposit the uh, amount required for payment, okay, amount to be paid deposit it in the bank or the relevant bank uh, that is if it if it is a peso amount to be paid so you need to deposit uh, the amount using the um, the peso uh, deposit rates okay and then uh, you need to convert at spot into your local currency or in this case into the US amount at spot and then you then have to borrow to borrow uh, using the US rate so uh, that is the trick ladies and gentlemen so now uh, let us do uh, I mean this process using the information given all right so how much are we going to deposit in the bank I said you need to deposit the actual amount and in this case how many pesos are we talking about we are talking of uh, 5 million pesos okay deposit sorry these are pesos five billion pesos divided by the peso uh peso deposit rate so we get back to the question and we can see that the deposit rate is 7.5 but this one is 7.5 per annum we only want six months so we say 7.5 percent divided by two because six months is just a half of the year so which means uh the the relevant percentage applicable is 3.75 percent so we come here and say divided by 1.0375 so this is going to give us how much if we use our calculators we are going to get um, how many pesos here we're going to get uh, four eight one nine two seven seven point one one then you convert this uh, at spot like I said when you are converting these currencies you are always going to be on the uh, beta side on the beta side the bank is always going to benefit so uh which if we are converting these pesos into us which rate is going to give us fewer dollars that's the trick which rate is going to give us fewer dollars all right so we are converting at spot rate so obviously we are coming to these rates so between the two which one is going to give us fewer dollars obviously this rate if we divide with this rate we are going to get fewer dollars so that's the trick so we are going to say we come here and say please convert uh, four eight one nine uh, two seven seven point one one pesos uh, by twelve uh, five eight two 
which was the higher rate there and we get the usd amount okay the usd amount becomes 380 sorry it's not 380 uh, sorry there is three eight three uh zero two nine point five zero okay then we go to another step that is we need to then borrow okay we are going to borrow these dollars we're going to borrow these dollars three eight three zero two nine point five zero so when we borrow this us dollar amount or the us dollar amount we are going to be charged interest in usd so we come back to the uh question and check for the borrowing rates for usd and we discover that we discover that we are going to use this rate but remember this is also given on a per year basis so you need to change i mean to modify it or to change it or to bring it to the six months rate so that's 4.5 percent divided by two and this comes to uh what is this now 4.5 divided by two that's uh two point i mean uh two point two five two point two five percent that's the six months rate okay so remember it's interest we are paying so it means that we, we when we repay we are going to repay uh We're going to repay it uh, as an increased increased amount so we multiply by 1.0225 so that gives us uh, an amount of 392 seven nine six point seven five okay so that's the amount we are going to repay okay we are going to repay the bank all right uh this amount and uh, we will then have to pay our you know our our supplier the peso amount but i want you now to i mean not to be confused on have we answered uh this particular question um was this information required the examiner did not want us to do these computations however by doing these computations you are going to be able to answer this particular question because it was not going to be easy for you to determine which rate was being applied where so for example in the first stage here i said we start by depositing and the rate we were going to use in depositing was that amount okay 3.75 percent so you can see that this was the rate we are talking about and the rate for borrowing i talked of borrowing here and the rate of for borrowing was the 2.25 percent and you can see that we have actually asked the question however i did all these computations for you to understand where we are coming from and where we are going okay now at the end of these computations like i said you need to ensure that you repay this amount to the bank all right and then you repay uh, i mean you pay the actual peso amount to 
the supply. Remember, the question was just saying that at the moment, the company was facing some difficulties in paying uh, its, uh, I mean, in uh, its cash flows. However, it wanted to just uh, hedge against the risk of adverse, uh, you know, exchange rate movements within the money economy. So they took this money market hedge just to safeguard their cash flow position while it's waiting for ordinary cash streams to come along the way. Okay, so in essence, they've actually hedged against the US dollar that is a strong currency by taking, um, you know, uh, the money market hedge so that when they, uh, you know, when they deposit the USD, uh, when they deposit, remember, we say that the first step was to deposit that amount. So when, you know, when the investment of uh, that deposit of the pesos was uh, accruing some interest in the bank, it was going to, you know, leverage the, the, the cash flow position of this company such that by the time they will now uh, have to pay the 5 million peso amount, they won't be, you know, facing some cash flow abundance. All right, and their cash value was uh, going to be stable. So that was the purpose of the money market hedge. All right, so it doesn't mean that you just have to go out there and take the money market hedge, I mean, you, you borrow without other, you know, cash flows that are going to come. Because remember here, without other cash flows coming, it means that it's either they've just taken a loan from the bank to repay uh, the supplier, but still, they were going to be required to repay again the bank. So uh, it doesn't mean that taking the money market hedge uh, relieves you from the burden of accruing your ordinary income. You need to accrue the ordinary income, but you need to safeguard the value of your incomes on the, uh, I mean, at the date of the uh, transaction. Okay, you need to just ensure that your value is not uh, depleted by adverse exchange rate movements, exchange rate or interest rate movements. Okay, that being said, we should move on to this particular question. Which of the following methods are possible ways for ZPS Co to hedge its existing foreign currency risk? Could they use uh, matching receipts and payments we have read in the question that they were no longer having they were not having uh at the moment they were not having any income in the pesos which means there were no you know uh, there were no receipts at the moment so we couldn't uh, hedge the payments uh, i mean match the payment with any receipt so in that regard matching is wrong so anything that has got a one is wrong so you are left with the c and d <laughs> so you know you see to answer these multiple choice questions it's very easy as you can see how i'm doing it now current uh swaps do you think the current swap i mean current swaps could be effective okay um now we have got uh current swaps current swaps are just uh, derivatives used to exchange a series of currencies uh as a way of of hedging okay one party exchanges currents with another party to ensure that you know the current risks are minimized well, in this context, uh, yes, Z, ZPS can use that. I There is nothing wrong with that. So current swap can be effective. There are two currencies involved, the peso and the USD. So it can work. What about leading and lagging? This one is a, is a technique where... Uh, a company might decide to pay early 
anticipating you know adverse or favorable exchange rate movements or or let me just say foreign exchange foreign exchange rate movements or interest rate movements so th that speculation they might motivate a company to pay early all right now when we talk of lagging lagging is about you know to negotiate to delay payment however in this case that opportunity to delay is no longer there because we are told that the payment has to be made in six months time so that opportunity is no longer there or that flexibility is not there so obviously this one is wrong so anything that has got a three is wrong so we are left with uh, option c currency features these are standardized exchange traded derivatives which could also be used and considering the amount of money involved in this particular contract then uh the current features might as well be a best option we're talking of millions of dollars here so obviously the current features could be a viable option so our answer is c let us look at the last question zps core also trades with companies in europe which use the euro as their home currency in three months time zps will receive three hundred thousand euros from a customer which of the following is the correct procedure for hedging this receipt using a money market hedge we have i have already given you uh the hint on dealing with a payment and i said if it is a payment start by depositing converting and borrowing okay so the other way around will apply if it is a receipt so you start by borrowing <laughs> okay converting depositing and then you need to uh use the customer payment to repay the loan so a is our answer please follow my technique you're not going to be wrong if you follow my technique you are not going to be right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I have, I mean, I have, you know, managed to assist you guys. So, I hope you guys are now ready for your mocks. All right. Uh, the other two questions, I mean, the, the section C questions, are just going to come from areas we have already touched by now and i expect you guys to just maneuver in all other areas remaining okay i urge you guys to go deeper in your cost of capital cost of capital uh topics the uh capital structure topics okay the other topic of interest well, the investment appraisal. The computation of your payback period, discounted and undiscounted payback periods. You need to be able to, you know, do your sensitivity analysis computations. You also need to cater for working capital management. The issue of factoring. The issue of receivables management, the issue of inventory policies, okay? Don't forget the CAPA and project specific cost of capital. So all those areas, the Modigillian and Miller, m and M, no tax and with tax or tax and with the tax the traditional view okay the traditional view of capital structure all those things you need to be able 
to have them at your fingertips and of course continue to do your computations in risk management all right derivatives are going to come okay the forward uh forward contracts the forward rate agreements the money market hedge we have done the uh the payment but you can as well do the receipt you know tempo and play around with these computations until you feel like you are comfortable with working out the questions until next time ladies and gentlemen please continue to feel excited and i mean it feel very very excited i am signing out bye